recording in progress. All right. Uh, so anyway, but yeah, I think, so let's, let's, um, let's go back to the, the original topic of kind of, you know, owning the shop. Like I said, I want to go back to like how it started for you. Obviously everybody knows that I was a, I was an educator. I left that. I work in the outdoor industry here in the States full time. You know, now I have the shop here, but like, it seems like, like I said, like everybody that I've known has stumbled into an archery shop, either they, you know, they were in high school, they were in college and they started working in a shop as their part-time job. And then they kind of like worked their way into a managerial role. And now that's what they do. Clearly they didn't go to school to be that, or they started in an actual, you know, full-time field doing something else. They have a degree in something else. And then they ended up buying out an archery shop or it was a family owned business or something. And now they're kind of, you know, stuck with it. Um, and so I kind of, I want to talk about that because I don't think it's much different for, you know, what your situation is in Australia than what we have mostly here in the States. Yeah. So mum and dad owned an archery business. Um, it wasn't big enough to employ me. So I went and got a university degree. Mum and dad got divorced. So dad set up an archery shop and mum's got an archery range. So, okay. so mum's got an archery range. Dad had an archery shop. I moved to Canberra for work. I worked in IT. Um, so I get to Canberra and there's, well, I'm going to say there's really no archery shop. There was an archery shop which was there, which was, I'm going to say, not very good. Um, so I started setting up and selling stuff to my local club. Um, I was the coach. I was pretty much everything um, just because I wanted to help people. So not to really make money, but I grew and I grew fast. So my first year, I probably sold, you know, let's say 50,000, then 250,000, then 500,000, then 750,000, then a million. And I was in my backyard and I was doing this after work. So I'd come home from the public service and work from five o'clock till seven o'clock or to midnight doing internet orders, literally just doing this, um, just to get is ahead. This, um, is this like recurve archers, compound, mixture of everything? I mean, mainly, that's a lot of stock both. to be doing. Yeah. And in your backyard, in a garage. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a lot. It was a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, so Canberra's mainly hunters. So Canberra... Okay. In Adelaide, it's so Canberra is in the middle of the wilderness and, and surrounded by hunting. So you've got deer, pigs, I'm going to say goats, um, literally within 20, 30 minutes of the centre. And you can hunt all year round, right? So okay. hunting was pretty big. Saying that, the archery club that I belong to was small when I joined. It had four members, but then I built it up and we had 100 members. Right. Mm. So all the clubs built up when I was there. So all the clubs grew. I took 20 kids away to the nationals. That was the most we've ever taken away to a nationals from that state. That state will have probably four kids competing this year. Um, so just build the sport, build it, get more people shooting, get more people involved. So that's how I started. I didn't want to have an archery shop. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> want one. I was like, yeah, but I wanted people to shoot. I wanted people to have the right gear. And it just, it annoys the heck out of me when I see junk being sold and people not being set up correctly. So it was, that was my passion. So it was like, that's how I got started. Um, I left the public service about... 15 years ago, um, my son was struggling at school. And when I say struggling, um, I was a single dad and working full time and having an archery shop. My archery shop was going broke and I took long service leave. And within two weeks, I'd fired my staff for stealing. So mm. three staff I'd fired for stealing. Um, I was losing lots of stuff. Like it was just walking out the door, so to speak. Um, and then I had that decision, like, do I go down this archery path or do I go back to the public service? Do I close the business down? So I was like, oh, let's see how it goes. And within two months or three months of me running the business, it started building back up. 
um, as far as my bank account started to build back up and I was like, oh, this isn't too bad. And I employed some more people and I was like, oh, well, let's see what happens. And literally within two years, I built it up to 5 million in turnover. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much how I got into it and, um, and left the public service life. Um, but whether that's the right decision or not, that's another question. Yeah. That's, but, that's a totally different question. Yeah. How's your, yeah. how's that, uh, the pension life coming there? That's uh that's always so, a fun one. Yeah. Like, well, I earned good money in the public service and I got offered jobs in the private enterprise, which paid even more, but yeah. I don't know. Like, I didn't mind this. I like the people in the archery business. Like yeah. it's like a big family. Um, like you've known them. I'm going to pick, you know, the lady from Neat, Brenda. I'm going to pick Kelly Rees from Trubal. Like I've known them since they were 20, since when I was 20. And I'm going to say Kelly's now 50. I'm 50. Brenda's 50. I'm 50. And, you know, like it's, there's a lot more people, but it's, you kind of grow up with them all. And it's like, it's like a big family and it's, yeah, it feels quite good at times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when, um, so, you know, I, you know, to kind of contrast that, you know, to what we have here in the States, you know, so for when you say, when you say 5 million, you know, we're talking what, probably about 3 million US somewhere yeah. in that. Yeah. So yeah, about yeah, 3 yeah. million. That's a that's yep. an insane number, and for most of the shops here, you know, uh, for us here in the United States, you know, to kind of give relative perspective, you know, we were talking about this before, uh, is that it's you're kind of a you're not just a shop, but you're also a wholesale distributor. You deal with a lot of not only in your state of Australia but across the across the continent, and so yep. you're kind of getting hit on the you have people ordering stuff, you have shops ordering stuff, and then you have walk-in customers you need to sell bow to all at the yep. same time. So yep. how big of a staff are you, are you employing to get that level of work? Today, um, we have about um, eight staff. Okay. Yeah. And how many would you say are in front office versus the floor, if, you, if that makes sense? Um, so sales are probably split relatively evenly between the three areas. Okay. So um generally in the walk-in store like some days you don't see anyone and then some days it's flat out and all your staff are out on the floor walk dealing with the walk-in customers right yeah. so mm -hmm. um and then on weekends i i close my shop on weekends now but i have kids come in and work and they're doing the website at the moment or they build stuff or um just pack stuff away so on the weekends we still work but um it's a bit different but Basically, sales to me, I don't, I don't split, I don't split by you're a wholesale person, you're in charge of wholesale, you're in charge okay. of retail. Everyone does everything. I don't, yeah. So when I've been seen shops before, like I've been to big wholesalers in America, they have people in charge of set things. Mm -hmm. So like in PSC, there's a person in charge of my account, there's a person in charge of packing my account. It's not like that in my store. I just, okay. everyone does everything. Everyone's a jack of all trades, so to speak. Yeah, so yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and talk about this. Cause this, we had texted about this earlier in the week and it blew my mind, but in the States, most shops are open on weekends because that's yes. when in the States, most people are free and that's when people are in, but that is not the case in Australia. And I never would have guessed as to why, but could you tell the people of the American audience as to why you're not open on weekends? Cause this, this blows my mind. Okay. So weekends in Australia would be huge for me. Okay. So mm -hmm. huge sales. So if I wanted to have good sales, Saturday, Sunday is the time to do it. The problem is on Sundays, you have penalty rates, which is double time. So you've got to pay your staff double what they normally earn. So if our hourly rate is $34 an hour, $70 an hour. Saturdays is time and a half. So $34 gets converted to, you know, roughly 50 odd dollars an hour. It's very hard to make money at $50 an hour. It's very hard to make money at $70 an hour because you're with a person for several hours setting up a bow and the margins on bows and the setup and all that is generally not enough to cover those costs. It's very hard to get people who want to work on weekends. Um, 
So, yeah, so for me on weekends, people would all come in at like 10 o'clock and want to buy bows and I'm with them for two hours and then everyone complain. I was like, do you know what? <laughs> it's all too busy. I just, and I just wasn't making money. At the end of the day, I was paying out all this money in salaries. I'm like, how much did I sell? It doesn't justify it. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to get, get, I wanted to get a life back as well. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I do because I'm still here on Saturdays. Um, but I wanted to, I want that choice. So yeah. Yeah. But that, Saturdays and Sundays would be big. Yeah. That, that it's when we had talked about that, that was mind boggling to me because Saturdays and Sundays are obviously our biggest day. And and for my shop, we're odd. You know, I don't get a day off between full-time work and, and here I'm working seven days a week. And, but that's fine. You know, that's, I, I love that lifestyle. I wouldn't know what to do. I can't sit around just twiddling my thumbs. Like, and if, cause if I'm not, if I'm not working on somebody's bow, I'm working on my bow. If I'm not helping somebody else shoot, I'm shooting. So it's, it, it makes sense that I might as well be, get, be getting paid if I'm going to be screwing around with a bow. Um, but the idea like here in, you know, at least in, in Pennsylvania, in this state, there was a lot of, we call it blue laws. So like you can't hunt on Sundays in Pennsylvania. There was a, a long time law that you couldn't buy alcohol on Sundays in Pennsylvania, a whole bunch of other things. So no one had anything else to do. And so to have a shop open on a Sunday, we get a lot of guys during archery season or tournament season will blow their bow up on Saturday and they need somebody with the press. And I'm the only open person on Sunday. And so they're, they're lined up out the door. And so even though I don't get a day off, um, I don't have to pay employees and my shop is big enough to, or not yeah. too big that I can't handle it. Uh, but yeah, that was fascinating to me that you weren't open on weekends because of the, the minimum wage laws of, of Australia. Is that specific to the continent or to just to your state? Australia. Australia. Wow. It's an Australian award. So. Wow. That's wow. So, um, Transitioning for, so I want to talk about the, the average customer say, you know, we spend all this time and that's good. You know, we want to spend all the time we can per, setting up a person because the more time we spend with them first off, the fewer problems traditionally we have later down the road. Not all the time. Absolutely. They still go drive fire the bow and accidents happen. Yeah. But in terms of the, the ratio, would you say, or percentage of customers that come into your store that have never shot a bow? You know, if you take 10 customers that come into your store on a, on a Friday, how many of them would you estimate or percentage wise overall have never shot a bow before ever stick and 90%. string or a compound? Really? 90%. Yeah. 90%. Really? Yeah. That isn't because that as someone here now we, we do, I would say it's less than half for us. Usually they have, I've shot a bow in the past. Maybe they did it at school. Maybe they have, you know, their uncle or their dad hunts or they shoot a bow or something and they've been exposed to it. But ninety percent have never, never drawn back and released an arrow. Yep, that is wild. What I mean, yeah, what is that easy. like? Scary. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so so that then lends the question. Then are they looking? If you're brand new to the sport here in the states, you're brand new to the sport. Most of the time, you're getting into it to go hunting. Is yeah. that the is that the case though in Adelaide, or is it? They're looking for something to do. Both. So a lot of people want to go hunting, especially with COVID. So COVID yeah, created this yeah. whole thing that people want to be self-sustainable, that they want to be able to survive if the world goes crazy. So that's definitely created a movement where people, I've, get, I've got so many girls now who come in who want to hunt. I want to be able to kill stuff with a boat. And it's like, you're not strong enough. You've got to build muscles. This is going to take time. So there's definitely a thing with that. Um, but I've got the other thing is people want re recreation. Um, so my last two bow sales on Friday night, I'm going to say we're recreation, but they may hunt in the future. So but start off with recreation. So, so yeah. are they getting, excuse me, are they getting into recurve then compound mixture of both mixture of both so the clubs so the club scene so we've got let's say in my state uh, um let's say we've got 15 clubs there may be more but let's say 15 each of those clubs will do beginners courses which will then funnel people to me to buy gear okay, okay so of those people who are going to be club members maybe 60 to 70 percent will be recurve so recurve's a big part of it. 
um, recreational archers, 90% will be compound. Okay. Because it's easy. It's like, I don't need the muscles. I just want to be able to go out and shoot. Um, but recurve is big for me. I can't recurve is maybe so compound used to be 90% of my business, but recurve now the number of people who are converting from compound to recurve or to bare bow, it's a, it's a big percentage of my business. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's maybe 60% now of my sales are recurve. And whether that's because I have a big recurve selection um, and the other shops don't, because the other shops don't have a big recurve selection in Australia. And I've got a big, big recurve selection. So there's part of that. Um, the recurves, like my archery club, 300 archers, there might be 10 compounders and the rest are longbow and recurve. Now, do you so, think, yeah, so at the, when you, so this is an interesting dynamic that we have here in the States, in certain pockets even of the States, compared to say, you know, other international countries that it's, it, it's you got to have a poodle. If the poodle is not there, <laughs> it's not an archery supplies video. Um, That's if uh you know so for example here in the eastern northeastern part of the country you know our clubs are like 3d clubs right mm -hmm. so it's mostly compound very few trad shooters we'll have some trad hunters whereas say out you know towards like the olympic training center out in colorado or in certain more affluent city areas they'll have more recurve shooters because their clubs have 70 meter ranges or 50 meter mm -hmm. ranges or whatever we don't have that here is that probably a good skew for the reason because it's kind of more of the international recurve field archery thing? Um, or do you think it's just kind of just personal preference? No, it's clubs. So the clubs here. So in my state, I'm going to say the, the club five minutes away from me is a 3D club. So they've got, let's say, 200 members. Um, but then I'm going to say there's two 3D clubs out north and then membership's quite small. So all up the 3d in my state is much smaller than the target scene um and i think a lot of it's recreational 90 percent of my archers my customers are recreation so they shoot at home they don't belong to clubs they just recreationally shoot at home so just to just to stick an arrow into something like that's yeah, really just, all it's about i think a lot of them are just relaxation it's just they do it because they enjoy the shooting they enjoy the they enjoy the activity they don't some of them won't join clubs because of anxiety they don't want to go to a club um some will go well i'll hunt when it's you know when i get better um so they may never progress to a hunter um i mean we've got obviously hunters but mm. You know, ninety percent of the customers coming in are newbies, and it's like, well, I just want to learn to shoot, um, yeah. and then, and then sort of see what happens from there. Is it relatively inexpensive to join a club, either the three D or a field one, or is it a or is it a so, decent investment? So, for my club, I belong to Adelaide Archery Club, three hundred dollars a year, so two hundred American dollars, and you can shoot as much as you want for free. Um, so that there's sounds pretty par there. for the course. Yeah, here so, in the States, it'd be about the same. There's people down there every day of the week shooting. Um, some of the other clubs are similar and some charge a $5 shoot fee. Um, okay. So for my indoor range, we've got an indoor range here. We charge $10 to shoot indoor. Um, so, yeah, that's I, – I don't think it's money that's affecting – that's driving anything. It's just people's time. People are really busy. Um trying to pay bills oh absolutely it's not so, getting any better it's not so, getting any better at all <laughs> we're trying we're trying to get a better it's not at all um so i want to i want to pivot you know so there's not too much different in you know the australian archer the american archer i would say obviously here in the states we have a, a mass a bigger push on the on the hunting side but i do want to talk as a shop owner to a, to another shop owner in terms of what you know i i think some of the things that we're legally allowed to talk about that people don't understand about the numbers behind an archery shop what people don't understand is like okay i really wish you had this bow in red with white limbs 
sure, we got a blue and white limb, we got a black and black, we got a gold and gold or whatever the color. But I really wish yep. you had it in red and white. And I kind of want to, you know, here in the States, it's a little bit easier because our freight is obviously, we don't have to fly things in. We don't have to whatever. But in terms of lead times, in terms of, I, I love it when I see your video and you'll be, a guy will be like, yeah, I would really like this. You know, when, when is it going to be in? I have no freaking idea. Here in the States, we also have no freaking idea. Um, right. It just, we know when it leaves, it's going to be a shorter, we don't have to wait a month for it to cross on a, on a boat. Um so I kind of want to talk about that a little bit because I think that's something people don't understand. Let's say, for example, you order a hundred thousand dollars shipment from Elite. That sounds pretty big. That sounds like that's very important. But at the end of the day, we still are kind of sitting here just as clueless as the customer uh, in a yep. lot of regards. Yeah, yeah. You're just basically buying bows on a hope that someone will want that bow in that color. It's um, and then sometimes they don't. It's like, yeah. So you're exactly right. You go, I want the blue one with white limbs and they want the red one. It's like, oh, the cams, you know, PSE went to three types yeah. of cams. Oh, fantastic. Because now they want a red with that cam on that poundage. And it's like, no, I have the other one. No, I don't want that. Because color yeah. is the most important thing to people. Yes. So it's so as, like, so as a, and so this is something that I've thought about a lot as a shop owner. And, you know, the stuff that I had, I'm not doing, you know, two and a half million. I'm not even doing close to that. But when I want to bring in product, I want to bring in product that's as kind of middle as the, of the road as possible. Now, you're on a, on a bigger scale, so you have the opportunity to, to have play at both ends. But in terms of what you see in like arrows or releases being sold, I mean, realistically, are you kind of going, okay, I know these are going to be the bread and butter and you're just gambling on the ends in terms of like, you know, this you know, 40 pound bow or an all pink bow or something like that? Yes, absolutely. It's a gamble. And you hope, you hope you get it right. Sometimes you don't and you hope that the majority of the time you do get it right. Because you might say, I need to stop Eastern Power Flight shafts because they're a big shaft for hunters. And they just sit there on your shelf because no one wants them anymore. But then you gamble. I'm going to go to the Pandaris brand of Arrow, which came out of China. It's like, is this going to move? Is this going to sell? And it's like, how many of those am I going to buy to see if it sells? And then, you know, will it sell? And, you know, what's going to be the growth in it in, in the future of it? Because how much do I invest? And you don't know until you do it. And it's like... It's very scary. I'm going to use the name a lot because you like invest like that elite shipment. I had an elite shipment coming in, which is close to a hundred thousand. It's, it's a handful of bows, and then I'm like, I hope I sell them. <laughs> like yeah. you, you don't know. You know, yeah. might, no one might want the new elite bow, and it's the same with every brand. Um, I saw another YouTube guy. He's like, Bowtech hasn't sold since they dropped Cole Douglas and Tim Gillingham. So I go to my Bowtech bows and I'm like, I'm sold out. So I need to have more of these. Even though this other guy who's got an archery shop goes, they're not selling. I'm like, and I think they're not selling because I think he's the only person who's got the Matthews in a, in America in stock. So he's selling heaps of Matthews because other shops don't, don't have them. And he's got a heap of them. So everyone's buying them off him. Where the average shop, like for your shop, if you can't get the Matthews title, because I'm guessing it's hard for you to get, um, and you've got a Bowtech Reckoning on the shelf, you'll probably sell that. That's my gut feeling of what's happening. Um, but it's absolutely gambling. It's it's very scary. And my dad had a shop for years, and my dad and mum had lots of fights over it. Because dad would buy 200 bows and mum would be like, they're never going to sell. That's You've wrecked everything. We're going to be broke. And dad would get them all in and sell them all and then have the same argument next month and whatever mm -hmm. else he brought. That was the business. And the same thing applies now. It's, you know, I've been doing it for 40 years and it's the same. I don't have an argument um, with my partner because she's not involved and she doesn't live with me, but... I would if she did live with me. I'd have that yeah. same argument. Oh, my wife so, and I say the exact same thing. It's like, why did we stock, you know, 10 grand worth of gold tip arrows? It's like, well, I mean, that's so that 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 kind of, you know, kind of lends me to this this thought that I've definitely had a lot of. And I've talked with other shops, you know, here in the States about it is, you know, would you rather almost to an extent kind of be like, OK, I'm going to sell 
you know, hardcore two brands of arrows and two bow companies and two different types of really, you know, really sell out into, uh, you know, put the same amount of volume, but into like two brands, for example. Um, do you feel that is something that I personally, as much as I would love to do that, I feel here in the States, that's not doable. I don't feel, I feel like people want the variety, you know, to heck with my financial situation in regard with it. They would rather have the variety and be able to see that than, you know, then, then have just two things where I've got everything and I can know how to work on those things. And I'm always involved with those things. Do you feel like the customers in Australia in particular, because there is such a time gap, you know? So for example, like here, you referenced the title, a title here for us is about eight to 12 weeks out. You know, if I ordered it right now, about eight to 12 weeks yeah. out. So, so nothing outlandish, but in Australia, you know, your customer base might understand if I order this thing, it might be like four to six months before I see that. So are they more yep. willing then to buy what you have right there because it's still a target bow or a hunting bow that, or a particular broadhead or air that fulfills their needs because they know they won't have to wait as long or are they kind of like us Americans and they're like, nah, I just, I want that particular color, that particular thing and I'm going to just wait for it. So the problem is if you don't have it in stock, they will go to Lancaster, they will go to Europe, they will go to England, they'll go to any shop in Australia to buy it. Okay. So if you don't have it, you're losing the sale. So when I moved to my state, South Australia, I got in here, I went to the clubs and I went to my mum's got an archery range and I went up there and I looked at what was being sold at the shop. So where were people buying their gear from? And a lot of people were mail ordering in stuff. So the local shop here, they weren't buying from. I don't want that. I don't want people buying from Lancaster. I don't want people buying off other stores. I want them buying off me. Um, now, sometimes you don't get that, right? Because you might not have a limb in poundage they want and they're impatient and it's like, I'll go and get that direct. Um, but I want to try and have it in stock. I don't want to give people a reason to buy overseas. Um, but yeah, that that debate, my dad and I had that debate. My dad was Martin and Gold Tip. That's all he stopped. Martin Bows and Gold Tip, right? So that was his shop. And he was literally a one-man business. And that's what he did. And my dad's argument for it, it made his life simple. He said, Stephen, by going to all these different brands, you're catering for more people, but you're making your life 10 times as, as hard. So you look at my carbon arrows, I've got literally every brand of carbon arrow you can think of. And yet there's still only going to be, you know, 10 dozen sold today. So if you just had gold tip, my dad's argument was that buy gold tip off you. But I'd say, no, I'm going to lose sales to other shops. I'm going to lose sales to the internet. I'm going to lose sales to Europe. I'm going to lose sales to America. So by me having everything, I'm taking away the... the opportunity i'm gonna say the opportunity for people to buy elsewhere i'm i'm giving them no reason to buy elsewhere so i'm like do i have everything that a person needs to buy off me um that's saying that you go back to your ten thousand dollar investment in gold tip and i always think if i had ten thousand invested in bitcoin am i better to have the gold tip invested or am i better have gold you know, 10,000 in Bitcoin, or am I better to have 10,000 in Black Eagle? Or am I better to have 10,000 in Eastern? Am I better have 10,000 in Pandaris? Because you've only got so much money. Yeah. And you've got to go, where does it go? It's, it's a really hard thing to know. Um, I built up slowly. So I had, I had $200,000 worth of gold tip and then gold tip were like, we're going to supply someone else. But I've got two hundred thousand dollars worth of gold tip stock. Yeah, I was gold tip for Australia. Everyone brought all their gold tip off me, and gold tip's like, we're going to sell to this gun shop down the road here because he's going to sell five hundred thousand a year. I'm like, how's he going to do that? Because he's going to sell to all the gun shops. No, it was a complete failure. They sold fifty thousand, and the fifty thousand was to me. So that no one else picked it up. Yeah. So no one else brought off him. And so, so my investment in gold tip was, and you know, my dad's lifelong commitment to gold tip was just gone. And it was like, and it literally was gone within one year of him dying. 
And I was like, well, geez, that was great. You know, like yeah. me taking over goal tip from him, my inheritance, I stuffed up in a year. And I don't yeah. think I did anything wrong. It's just the sales rep changed, the goal tip changed ownership. It got brought out by the Bushnell group, whatever they are. Mm-hmm. And and it was like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna sell more gold tip. It's like, no, you're not. But anyway. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting. Just- it's interesting that because outside of Bose, like Bose are the only part in the States anyway, where there is brand uh, or dealership um, protection. It, so, you know, arrows, releases, broadheads, we have zero protection. Um, if I want to sell Magnus, the dude 20 minutes down the road can sell Magnus. If I want to sell gold tip, so, Bose, they get a little bit different on dealer. They'll, they'll, they'll kind of and it's still flexible. You know, I'm a Matthews dealer, but there's another Matthews dealer 20 minutes down the 25 minutes down the road. Um, mm-hmm. There's another one within another Zowards drive to to the one direction. So, and granted, we do have probably more, I don't know, maybe more people within a particular area to, to allow that to happen. But yeah, in terms of, and that's why I don't want to be brand as much as brand specific, because there is no protection. You know, if I, if I'm like, Hey, gold tip, I'm going to do 10,000. They're like, cool, here, here's 10,000. And then if Bob down the road wants to do 10,000, they'll give 10,000 to him too. So it's, there's none of that here in the States so whatsoever outside Easton? of both. Oh yeah. Oh, I, have see, East, I, I, have Easton. I know you can't get Easton. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm it's, like Easton, I will buy $200,000 from you and I will sell more Easton in Australia than you've ever imagined. Easton's like, no, nah, stuff you. It's yeah. like, what? <laughs> I've been doing this forever. I know what I'm doing. But anyway. Yeah. It's yeah. lots of other it's in, it's interesting. It's very interesting. Like, so, um, one last thing I'll, I would I love wanna, that. One last thing I want to touch on. I would on. love. I would love, love to have those bows and all the brands. Yeah. Oh yeah, we have uh, we have uh, Athens. Which, if you have the opportunity to get your hands on an Athens in Australia, I think you would actually really like it. I think the you would cross between a boat tech and an elite. Yes, the cross the between. between I mean, a boat. So. <laughs> so the original, so I don't know if you know this, but um, some of the original engineers, when Elite had its kerfuffling, left, and they now own Athens. So hence right. why that's the that's the whole thing now. The Botex situation, yeah, I think you would actually like it. I think you should. I would love to see an archery supplies and the, review. And the the thing is, it's like going back to where you started. It's like if I'm going to invest ten thousand dollars in bows in Athens, how many of them am I going to sell? for my investment and are they going to sell in the year up against elite, which has got all the marketing and the, mm-hmm. and oh, that's yeah. been my question, because if you take the brands like Matthews, PSE, Hoyt, elite, Botech, they all have all these shooters shooting for them. They have all this marketing and advertising. And when you pick up a, I'm going to say a smaller brand, yeah, very hard to have any market penetration at all. Yeah. Like it's got to be you who pushes it. Yeah. Um, and what you're doing is you're pushing a sale away from elite to another brand. So that's the hard bit. People don't understand that. They do not understand that at all. They, like if Athens, if Athens had shooters, if they had, if they, if people were in my shop saying you need to stock Athens, I would stock Athens. Oh, I'm not saying you need to stock it. I'm just saying you need yeah. to try one. Oh no, I think it looks awesome. Yeah. I think it looks. I think it looks amazing as far as a bow. The quality looks good, but it's like, how many of them would I sell? Like I brought Darton in. Darton's, I don't know. Do you sell Darton? No, I don't sell Darton. See, like, because it's like they've got um, Braden there. They've got people shooting Darton. And I was like, and I used to sell Darton. Darton was my original brand. Right? Mm-hmm. I had a sales rep there. We're still close to, and I brought Darton back in after the company sold, couldn't, couldn't move a Darton. I can't even sell them for $200 less than cost price. They're a good bow. Yeah. No one wants them. But they it's, it's the branding and people, it's, people truthfully don't understand that. Like, it's the same thing. When I see you do videos on Pandaris eras, I wanted to ask you about this yep. kind of as a last thing, you know, victory and I mean, gold tips and established brand victory, black Eagles and established yeah. brand Easton, of course, how are you doing with, I don't see anybody else talking about them, but they're clearly a very solid arrow and they offer a lot of difference. How are you doing that? Cause I don't see anybody else talking about them. Amazing. Okay. I'm going to say the owner of the, if I was in, if I was you and I was in America, 
um, <laughs> I would be like, I would be on the phone with this guy and be like, I've got a shot. I've seen this guy. What could, you know, what's the deal? What's the deal here? Can I get exclusive Pennsylvania? Can I have exclusive for Eastern America? Can I have exclusive for America? Because if I can get exclusive for America, I'm going to make a lot of money, right? It's amazing. They've got, they've got 5.2 shafts. They've got four point. So you've got your VAPs, yeah. 4.2, you've got your 5.2s now. You've got your 6.2, which is your normal gold tip hunter. You've got your fat indoor arrows. You've got your equivalent of X10s. You've got your X10 Pro Tours. You've got your X10 straight ones, which was really weird. The last one that Eastern just released, the straight X Tour, Pandera's had that like last year and I couldn't move them because I was like, mm-hmm. this is weird. Why have you got this? And then Easton brought out the same arrow. And I was like, that's really weird. So Easton brought it out one to two years after Pandera's already had it. So it's a, it's an amazing company. They've doubled in size. Um, they've just moved into a new factory. Um, the guy is really so the owner of the company, Kevin, he just sits there and chats to you. And he's like, I mean, I couldn't. And the price point, I'm selling a made up. So a made up 4.2 arrow. So it's like a VAP, a VAP Elite 0.001 made up. So with veins, knocks, pin knocks, target points for $100 a dozen. So that's $80 a dozen for a made-up 4.2. That's nuts. So, so you compare that to your Black Eagle, God, what is that? The Black Eagles Carnivores or something? The Black Eagle Skinny ones? Maybe the, the X Impacts or something like that, yeah. And they will do whatever you want. If you go, I want blazers on those things, I want inserts, they'll do it. And if you go, and you know, like their tungsten points, uh, they look identical to the Eastern target points. Yeah. Identical. You know, we tested the grain weights of them. It's, I just, yeah. I. But do you see, game. do you see, so this is something I think is the last talking point. Do you see the brand loyalty though from your customer? So like, for example, like if I have a guy whose pappy shot, his grandfather shot gold tip, his uncle shoots gold tip, now he's going to shoot gold tip. Do you have that level in your store? Are people more interested in price point and are willing to change because of it? You would think there's brand loyalty, okay? So you think like, you think Easton was, in my state here, my dad was only gold tip. So everyone shot gold tip. Everyone in the state was gold tip, right? And, you know, there were some people shooting Easton, but everyone shot gold tip. Right. And then I brought victory in and victory. There was a lot of people shooting victory. Right. So there's people shooting Eastern. My club has, let's say 300 archers. Most will be shooting Pandaris now at the state championships. So that's like all the clubs together. I'm shooting cloud archery where you lob the arrows yeah, at yeah, yeah. the target, you know, 180 meters away and all the targets are on the ground. All the arrows are on the ground. Most of them were Pandaris arrows. And I'm like, so there's a component there on price. So beginners come in as like, this is super cheap. There's also a component there that I shoot pretty decent with them. So I think, so for me, it starts off with the beginner arrows. So you start off with cheap hunting beginner, beginner stuff because it's affordable and cheap. Um, and then you go into the target stuff. Now, I know you don't have the amount of target shooters that I would have as a percentage of your business, but as far as getting beginners into the sport, I would be focusing on the like the 4.2 stuff to get people started in the sport, and I would be thinking bigger than just my customers. I'd be thinking about mail ordering and how I grow the business for a bigger thing. So I wouldn't be just thinking about my existing business. I'd be thinking about growing my business. So I think it would be very quick. Like elites just added, added arrows. Black Eagle is basically comes out of some factory somewhere. Um, yeah, that's what I'd be thinking. 
So I think customers would switch very quickly. Now, your hardcore hunters, they're still going to shoot your VAPs, your RIP TKOs. They're still going to buy that. They're still going to buy the gold tips. But this is new people getting started. You're going to pick up a lot of that stuff. The target archers, you're going to pick that up. Uh, the ice points, 4.2s. You probably don't sell many X10s because you don't have many recurve archers. But so I wouldn't probably start with the X10 stuff. I would start with the cheaper stuff and just go with that and build it. Yeah, but I'd want to how, try and secure. Yeah, with how many new archers you have? I would want to secure a region. Right? Lock so I'd want down. to secure, I would want to lock down an area and say, I am Pandaris. I'm going to push your brand. I'm going to get your brand into a whole bunch of shops. That's going to be my drive to get your product into a whole bunch of shops. And it's going to change things. So that's the way I'd be. And I don't know what, what he would do, but I would ask the question because it's such a big brand. He's growing. He's got spin wings. He's got knocks. He's got points. He seems to have, he seems to build stuff really quickly and yeah, I would, and he's going to come out with all your, like your TKO style shafts this year, like the cross weave carbon weave, that's yeah. coming in this year. Um, I would be on it and see if I could become bigger become than Pandaris. in your area. <laughs> But they also brand. So they might make, I'm going to say they might make brands for products for other arrow manufacturers and they will brand you arrows with your own brand mm -hmm. because they already do that for a whole bunch of arrow manufacturers, right? Yeah. So if you didn't want to be Pandaris, for me, I didn't want to have a brand. I was just happy to sell other people's stuff and live off their branding. Um, but you could develop your own brand. I don't have much interest in developing my my brand. I just want to put that stuff out there. I'm happy to promote his business. Um, but like you'll still sell your all your other stuff, but this is just growing your business, selling it to shops, and I think it would be huge. Are there other, so, you know, are there other brands then like Pandera, so you might not have heard before, but offer this great price point, have good customer service, have good shop service. Are there other brands or, or maybe a other brand that you can think of on this internet? You have much more of an international scene yeah, than yeah, right. we do here so, in the States. Is there another so the, brand that we should keep an eyeball on genuinely? So, so the products <laughs> I would look at would be Toe Point in China. So they do yeah, inexpensive. The kids' bows are amazing. The M2. Yeah, the M2 looks it's great. Like, it's a, it literally kicks every other kids' bow on the market, and it's less than half the price, and it comes with everything, release aid, sights. It comes in all the colors. There's no competitives for that, right? So you're going to say, oh, the PSC mini burner. No, there, there's no competitors. It's yeah. like this is American limbs. These are metal cams, metal riser. They have the M3, which is the plastic bow, which is really good for the little kids, the six-year-olds. It's a game changer. Then you move up to their T1 kits. They've got a hunting kit, and it's got the arrows, the sights, the release aids. person walks into your shop, they're a beginner. It's like this is what you want. You can turn that customer around, teach them to shoot, set up the bow because it's already pretty much set up, get them out the store in, you know, 30 minutes. Um, where with the brand, I'm going to just pick another brand. You've got to grab the arrows. You've got to grab the release aid. You've got to grab stuff, take a lot of time, right? This is, we're talking about time efficiency and turning stuff around and increasing sales because you've only have so much time. So it's, how do I make the most amount of money in the least amount of time? Toe point has it. They have target bows, which are not even comparative now in price point to the American stuff. They used to be, but the American stuff's jumped. The Chinese stuff is less than half price and it's really, really good. Um, so toe point, I would definitely look at. I would look at um so, and that's more than one, but um I would look at the other Chinese um trad bows because like Lancaster's sticking their brands on it. And there's so many people that take down Longbow. 
that I've got where it clips together in the handle, mm -hmm. that would sell out in America. I would, thousands of those things you'd sell in America. The traditional hunting bows in America, like Americans love the traditional hunting stuff. Um, you've got all the ILF limbs that all click in. That would be amazing. Um, I, I think Europe is underutilized. I think Biter, I know like you probably don't have Biter Knox in your shop. It's like Biter. It's a simple transaction to get Biter Knox, Biter plunges into your shop and suddenly hey, I've got stuff from Europe and it's like simple and you don't need to big investment. You can bring it in by a small amount, save your stamp duty and tax because it comes in a small shipment and Biden Ox will just, they'll just move because it's a well-known brand. Um, the product then you'd look at after <laughs> after that, you'd have to look at, um, you've got a big, have you got Bearbo? Is that a thing? Yeah, Bear's, Bear's huge for us, yeah. Bearbo, Bearbo, like bear shooting with, you know, string walking? No, not bear bow, bear archery, the brand. Oh, uh, yeah. So, well, bear bow is pretty big. So, like, Yost, very yep. small company, a tab, and they sell bear bow weights. That's pretty big. The Yuka limbs from France is very unique. Um, I wouldn't go there until you're bigger. Um, so, I would start, i definitely consider, see if I can lock down some area with Pandaris, toe point, I would want to lock down, try and see if I can lock down an area because game changer, bad change in business overnight. <laughs> but the problem is like, as you get bigger, it's like, you've got a job. Mm -hmm. How much time have I got? And then do I employ people? And you've got all the whole problems of employing people. Yeah. Um, it's never a problem about growing it's more of a problem with how do i manage like staff and the money but yeah um oh the other product which you'd bring in is the pakistan stuff you know the gloves the gloves for trad people and the, oh yeah, the yeah leather yeah. oh man would that sell that would be <laughs> you would go like a glove so neat and i love neat i love mm -hmm. like i love brenda and all that but they put up their prices and they're now they just the pakistanis um they make this amazing leather products and they're so cheap and there's quivers field quivers gloves you bring them in the freight doesn't cost much really good margin, like really, really good margin. And the customers will get and go, this is super cheap. And you're like, yeah, and I made decent margins on it. It's well worth like, because you've got to, you've got to turn over product. So you've got to turn it over so many times and you've got to have a margin on it. With these, these products, you can get margins and you can get turnover. Like when you bring in that Bowtech bow, that's red and white limbs at 60 pounds, am I going to sell that? But if I brought in trad gloves, trad quivers, would I sell those? And trad arm guards? Yeah, they will sell out no problem. It's not even a question. It's um, It becomes a question though, you'll run out of shop size. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> people, and pe people genuinely do not understand that. It's not a matter of... Companies are more than happy to take your money to put stock on the shelf. Yes. That's not a problem. It's, well, unless you're Eastman. Yeah, yeah, unless you're Eastman, at least in Australia. Um, but it, that's not a problem. Getting stuff in in that regard or, or expanding is not, but it, you're exactly right. It's at you're when you get to the the precipice of I have to move out of my garage. Now I'm in a retail space. Okay. Now do I move to a larger retail space? Okay, now holy cow. Now I got now I need an employee. Now it's too much. It's never a matter of can I get, but you can always get bigger. That is not the problem. It's how much time of your life do you want to invest in this to be the full-time job? And I don't think a lot of the shops in the States, I get email. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I get emails in particular this time of year, a lot from guys who want to start a shop. And I always hmm. go back, do you want to be a millionaire? Oh, uh, you know, I want to make some money. Okay. Well then have $2 million because <laughs> then you'll be a millionaire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what it is it it truly it's is not that. that you can't make it's not that you don't make money it's like as you be, as you're small 
when you sell a bow and you make $100 on the bow, it's $100 you made. As soon as you employ staff, you have now you sell a bow, you've got to cover their wages, and then you've got right. to cover the rent. So now, like, I had the big shop in Canberra where I was selling $5 million a year. I was making nothing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely nothing. My rent was 50 grand a year. I had five full-time employees. So you're talking at least 250,000 in salaries. Shop rent was 50. Insurance was 50. It was 300, 350 grand worth of expenses a week. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want to do this. Where when I was in my garage and I had low overheads, like here in this shop, it's relatively big. Um, when I say I own the building, the other buildings I brought pay for this building. So I don't pay any rent for this. It's free. So I've got a big, big building that's free. I have solar on the roof, free power. Usually, So I, the, my only costs are my staff. So my staff have to sell so much a day to cover their wage. So they record how much they sell a day. And providing they cover their wages, <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, as you get bigger and as you like, if you've got to pay rent, to me, it's uh, you've got to, it becomes all very questionable. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it took you 40 years of working through the industry, if you will, to get to this point. And, re- and again, a really strong 20 years. To get to this point, right? So I'm going to say when I was when I was 25, I went through a divorce, and I had nothing, nothing. I didn't have a car. I didn't have. She took everything, right? Um, she still lives in that same house today, right? She still lives there. She earns two hundred thousand a year. She lives in that same house that we split up thirty years ago. She still lives in that same house that I, I'm going to say I brought her, and we had our own money. But anyway. So I had nothing. So within two years, within two years of working the archery shop and having a full-time job, I'd paid off my house. Within another two years, I was doing really well that I thought I would make the rich list in Australia. I was like, I'm cruising, I'm balling, I'm making money, right? The thing is, back then, things were a lot cheaper. Like you could buy a house down the road for sixty thousand dollars. That same house today is eight hundred thousand dollars. I brought my first shop for a hundred thousand dollars, which I then sold for three hundred thousand. Yeah, things were a lot cheaper. The margins today are the same as when my dad had a shop forty years ago. We work on this small percentage. You. So all I can do, I can't make more money. All I can do is serve more people. I can be more efficient with my time. Yep. And that's the problem. But if you can get into a thing like I'm going to go to Pandaris where you can say, well, actually, I can make more money by selling a whole bulk of arrows, making more money per hour, then it becomes interesting. But then it comes, if you've got a degree, I'm going to say, even if you're a tradie, how much do I make per hour versus doing something else? Mm-hmm. You know, with COVID, before before COVID kind of just went crazy, I could buy houses here for $100,000 a house. And I was like, and people got sick of me because I was like, I should be buying houses. And I did, right? But I was like, I should be buying them and flipping them because I'd make more money buying and flipping houses than running an archery shop. And it all it all went crazy. You know, Bitcoin, I had all these miners running, making money. It was like, why would you have an archery shop? You've got to define why you want an archery shop. And it's definitely not to make money, but you want to make money. Um, and you've got to, like when I was in the hospital and I thought I was going to die, I was like, I was pretty relaxed. I was like, do you know what? I'm pretty happy with my lot in life. I feel like I've helped a lot of people i feel like i've taught a lot of people i feel like i've got lots of people in the sport i've got i feel like i've been a good person and i was pretty relaxed with it all we're not going to say that was like the 400 painkillers you were on like that was no i didn't take painkillers yeah yeah, yeah. so i had um a liver i had a liver thing there they were going to take out my oh liver that's right and... yeah 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 oh yeah so i was on no painkillers yeah i just i just sucked it up 
<laughs> so, but no, I was very relaxed. I was like, you know, I was, I don't mind the archery business. 99% of customers are wonderful. They're generally happy that you're there. They're happy that you show them stuff. The problem is the 1% that they blow up their bow, <laughs> which is where you started this video. And they blow up their bow and they're like, this is your fault. The bow's faulty. And it's like, man, it's not. We can fix it. It doesn't cost much. Yeah. I don't charge a lot to fix stuff. Yeah. I want you to have a good experience. That's the problem. The one percenters. 99% are great. As long as you go, actually, I can't let the 1% get to me. It's all pretty good, and I, it's generally a good experience. But if you, yeah, if you want to make a million dollars, I don't know anyone. No, who's done? No one. Rick McKinney setting up Carbon Tech Arrows. He then moved Carbon Tech to Korea or China. Like he still sells stuff, but you're not making Lancaster Archery was an. I don't know their story. I don't know how they got started. But all the big wholesalers that were around when I started are all closed down. Apes, Jake's, um, Jake's Archery's gone. Um, Oklahoma Archery, they were into oil. They're gone. Mm -hmm. um, there was lots of big wholesalers that all gone. Lancaster is left, but it's like, I don't know the story why they're there. And I know they've got it. I think they're doing lots of mail order out which the wholesalers didn't used to do so i think it's probably killing your local shops because the manufacturers are giving the product to lancaster first and as a result if you want the new xl site it's at lancaster and the local shop doesn't have it and i if it was me in america i would feel threatened by lancaster and i know people love lancaster and they sponsor lots of people but man there used to be lots of shops in america and it's like if they're getting big, I just question the whole dynamics of it, in which case I'd want to get big because I don't want to go out of business. Mm -hmm. I want to keep doing this thing. So my only – you can have this little niche business, which is cool, and you make you make money, and it's like I'm going to do this for so many hours because I enjoy this. But I could never do that because the crowds would be – when I had my business at home, people had to wait two hours to be seen by me. They were, they were yeah. queuing. Like there was 10 people deep lining up to see me and my neighbors didn't like the number of cars scrolling down the street. And then you've got to have a shop brand and yeah, if you offer good service, people come. And then when you employ people, it's yeah. The dynamic shifts. It's exactly dynamic right. Shifts. Yeah, that's yep. exactly right. Everybody, everybody asks me, you know, are, are you ready to get bigger? And I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to train somebody to work on a bow with my name on it. That's, yes. Cause it is, it's my, it's my brand. As you say, as the shop branding, it's, that's huge. And yes. that could be, that could be the tipping point. And that's a, that's a big, scary, scary thing. Uh, getting I know bigger, everyone I teach, everyone I teach with no exception. I don't think I've got an exception can walk to an archery club and they cannot pick that they haven't been shooting for years. They all shoot good. They, they don't blow up their gear. When they go up to my mum's, my mum knows which person in my shop has taught that person without them telling them. Cause she can tell if the person's been taught by me or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I take that as a, it's a pride thing that that person goes out and they can shoot. Where I started, I couldn't shoot. It was like, I was just left in this little black hole and I was just launching arrows everywhere. <laughs> it's like, it was just random. <laughs> now people come in and they go bang, 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 and they hit the gold. And it's like, that's amazing. You just don't, you don't even know how good that is. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the problem. As soon as you start employing people, it's like they need that same level of commitment that you have. And that's, that's hard because there's lots of jobs and there's lots of jobs that pay good money. So it's, um, it's very, very hard to get good stuff. Yeah. And so, well, Stephen, I want to thank you, uh, so much for your time, man. I will let you get back to work because even though it's yeah. like eight something, my time, 
it's uh it's Lunch. now the next day in the morning wherever the you know yes. <laughs> so i'll let you get back to it thanks for coming on but i appreciate Thank you. you uh Best keep doing you yeah keep doing what you're doing man us here in the states will continue to watch we really do appreciate it it's it's thank no you. nonsense it's great so thanks so much thank i want to uh wish you well with the rest of your day and hopefully you can come back and do this you know in a couple months Absolutely. and see how it went for you so why don't you get pandaris let me know yeah yeah that'll be good all right <laughs> thank, thank you, you. steven bye